Hello programmers, Dan McElroy here with a discussion on how to read and write random access binary files while simulating an automatic teller machine. This is not a program I would expect first semester students to write on their own. Here is a list of topics covered in the ATM presentation. Location of the source files and data files, binary data files, big Indian versus little Indian. The purpose of these programs is to demonstrate how to read and write a binary data file, not to do a simulation of a full ATM system. These programs are part of a lab project for a programming class. Students need to complete the program by writing code to process a deposit. Code for a deposit is to be similar to code for a withdrawal, but deposits are not limited to $500 or increments of $20. Code and data files are located at http colon slash slash program dash info dot net slash atm. There is a readme.txt file to help choose which files to use when building the ATM program in either Java, C, or C. There is a file for each of these languages that contains main and another file for the class definition or header file. Change the constant at the top of the class or header file to identify the path and file name for the location of the data file. The program is currently set to have the data files located in my documents folder. There are two versions of the data file. The atm underscore accounts dot bin file needs to be used if you are running a Java version of the program on any system or a C or C++ program on a non-Intel processor. The atm underscore accounts dot dat file needs to be used if you are running a C or C++ program on an Intel processor. Java wants to make its programs run exactly the same regardless of which processor is being used. If you get garbage when the program tries to display the data file, you know you have the wrong one. The discussion is divided into five parts. First, I'll start off with a sample execution of the program. The next part of the discussion covers opening and closing files, random versus sequential access. The ATM program has console I.O. routines for inputting integers, doubles, and single characters. These routines check for valid data when inputting integers and doubles, then loop until good data has been entered. A brief overview of the ATM program is given. You can look at the code for your desired language for a fuller description. Here is a sample run of the program. I can start off by entering a zero for the account number, and I'll end up displaying all of the customer records. Well, there are quite a few, but um, it's not a very big bank, I guess. I'm going to select one of them up here. I'll select the 6114878. I'll just do a copy and a paste. And then from my pen, copy, paste, 1781, there's my checking for $1,066.40 and savings of $3,507.27. Select an account. I'll select checking. And let's put some more money in. Uh, you're going to have to do that part because I'm not giving it to you. I'm going to deposit another $200. And now my balance is going to be $1,266.40. Uh, keep the same customer. And go back to checking. I'm going to withdraw $300. Now my balance is $966.40. Uh, keep the same customer. Go to checking. And how about doing a withdraw of $44.26. Oh, didn't like that one. And withdrawal must be in increments of $20. Since this project is simulating a program in an embedded system, it uses an infinite loop, while true, statement, so that the program never ends. You will need to stop the program yourself by clicking the red X or dot on the program's title bar, or use another means to end the program. Examples of embedded systems are ATM machines, gas pumps, microwave ovens, or any system where the software starts up when the system is powered on and the software keeps running as long as there is power. There are two different methods of storing integers and floating point numbers in memory and or on the disk. 
For example, when I look at each record on the disk for the ATM file, I see that they are stored in binary as two integers and two doubles. An integer uses 32 bits, or 4 bytes, and a double uses 64 bits, or 8 bytes of memory. The size for each record, then, is 24 bytes. The first record has an account number of 1096958 and a PIN of 9761. Checking balance of $1,008.52 and savings of $2,663.12. Using a calculator in programming mode, the account number converts to 10BCFE in hexadecimal. The PIN converts to 2621 hexadecimal. Leading zeros fill any unused bits to make a full 32 bits for each integer. Therefore, the 10BCFE for the account number is saved as 0010BCFE using two hex characters for each byte. The PIN is stored as 00002621. I'm not even going to bother with the conversions of the numbers in floating point double format. I have highlighted the 24 bytes for the first record in the atm underscore accounts dot dat file. It starts off as 0010BCFE 00002621 for the account number and the PIN. The order of the bytes is the most significant byte first, going down to the least significant byte. The rest of the highlighted data is for the doubles for checking and savings balances. Looking at the ATM underscore accounts dot dat file, the bytes are stored in reverse order with the least significant byte first down to the most significant byte. The account number is then stored as FEBC1000 and the PIN is 21260000. The order for storing bytes is referred to as either Big Indian or Little Indian. The Indianness labels for byte order was given many years ago by Danny Cohen, who must have been reading Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift at the time. In the book, when Gulliver visited the land of Lilliput, he saw the little people divided as to whether an egg should be cracked starting at the big end or the little end first. The byte order has absolutely nothing to do with the people from India or American Indians, but how engineers stored bytes in RAM when designing different processors. Java was developed at Sun Microsystems on a Spark system which stored data most significant byte first. The early Intel microprocessors were 8-bit processors and it was easiest to do math with least significant byte first. Now that we have 32 and 64-bit processors, the byte order in memory is not meaningful. C and C++ programs will access memory and disk files in whatever order is used by the processor. Java is designed to work the same, regardless of which processor is being used. So, it always stores data on the disk in big Indian format. What this all means is that I needed to provide two different versions of the data file, and you need to use the correct one for your system and programming language of choice. The data will look like garbage if you choose the wrong file. You can read more about Indianness on Wikipedia at en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash Indianness with capital E. Opening a file creates a connection between the file on the disk and the program. The file can be opened for reading, writing, or both. When opening the file for writing, it can be opened for appending, which means that the data will be added to the end of the file instead of at the beginning. A lock is placed on a file, especially when it is opened for writing, to prevent another program from also trying to write to the file at the same time. The file needs to be closed when the program is finished working with it. This allows other programs to have access to the file. Some programs such as C, C++, and Java will automatically close the file when the program ends. Other programs leave the file in an open state when the program ends. This can cause problems when another program wants to use the file. 
it is best practice to make sure that you close a file even if you're writing a program in C, C++, or Java. The record for each customer is 24 bytes long. Int account number, 4 bytes. Int pin, 4 bytes. Double checking, 8 bytes. Double savings, 8 bytes. After the account number has been entered, the program searches for that customer in the file. When the customer is found, the program retains the record position in the file. As long as that same customer is selected, the program can directly access the customer by its position in the file instead of searching the file again when a balance deposit or, or withdrawal request is made. The customer can be accessed directly by the record number times the number of bytes in each record. We can go directly to any location in a file. This is called a seek operation. A seek operation based on the record number works great as long as each record is the same size. Move the file pointer to the desired position by multiplying the record number by the size of each record. For example, to move the file pointer to the start of record 44, multiply 44 by the size of each record, which is 24 for the ATM data files. When searching for a record in a file, first you need to get the account number or name or whatever it is that you're searching for. From this point on in the discussion, I'm assuming that we'll be searching for an account number in the ATM data file. With a sequential search, you start at the beginning of the file, read a record from the file, and compare the search account number to the account number from the file. If they match, then you have found the customer record in the file. If they don't match, then you read the next record in the file and see if there is a match. This read, next record, and compare continues until a match is found or the end of file is reached without finding a match. With a binary search, the data in the file must be sorted by the search account number. Start at the middle of the file and read a customer record. If the record in the file matches the searched account number, then a match is found. If no match is found, See if the search number is greater than or less than the record from the file. Keep dividing the file in half until either a match is found or the file has nothing to divide. Once a record has been found, keep track of its position in the file for future operations on that record. By knowing the record number, seek command can be issued to return to the same customer record. Most file access methods have a rewind command that positions the file pointer back to the first record. Another way to get to the first record is to close the file and reopen it again. Let's take a quick peek at the code starting with the class files and the header file for the C++ program. This is atm.java. Starts out with a package statement which you may or may not have to change or if you're using a default package then you don't need it. Inside the class statement we have the four items that belong to each customer an integer for account number, an integer for the pin, a double for checking, and a double for savings. Then comes the default constructor which sets everything to zero. I also want to define what the size is going to be for one of these records. So I have the number of bytes for an integer times two and the number of bytes for a double times two. Then here are the setters and the getters and the two string method which I'll use to display the account information. Here is the header file for the C++ program. You may notice it's called atm.hpp. The file extension for C++ header files many times is .hpp. I'm starting off with the same type of four items in here. The integer for account number, pen, doubles for checking, and savings. Then here's the constructor, and the setters, and the getters. But this time I also have the function prototypes. For the C language program, it's called atm.h for the header file. I'm using a structured record, starting off with type def struct s, atm record, the same type of thing, In two integers and two doubles, function prototypes, etc. Here's the Java code for the program that has void main. Starts off by saying, Welcome to Phony Bank. Then the search for customer method asks for a customer number, the PIN number, and if it finds the customer, it returns a customer index. It also can return some error values like uh, can't open the customer file, account number not found, incorrect PIN, etc. 
The next thing that happens is there's a method for select transaction. So I'm either going to end up with a B or a D or a W or an X to B for balance, D for doc deposit, W for withdraw, and an X for cancel. At the end, do you want another request for the same customer? If the answer is a Y, then we'll go back and do the same thing again for the same customer. If it's a no, we'll go all the way up to the top here and ask for a new customer. Here's the code for search for customer where it's actually asking for the account number and either a, a zero to display the entire customer file. So if we end up with a zero, we're going to display the customer file. Then we're going to do a search. If it's a binary search, we'll go start at the middle and go forward or backward depending on whether the requested customer is greater than or equal to the uh, customer that we found in the file. When we're done, we'll return the customer index if it's found. Here's the code for select transaction. It puts out a menu message, B for balance, D for deposit, W for withdraw, or X for cancel. Read a character and if it's one of these guys here, we'll return. If it's not one of those, we'll say illegal selection. We'll go back and keep asking again. The code for the displaying of the file, we'll open the file, put a header up here, read the first customer, the account number, the PIN, the checking amount, and the savings amount, and place that into the display file starts off and creates an ATM object I'm calling customer. We'll open up the file, put a title header at the top of our display, and then read the account number, the PIN, the checking amount, and the savings amount all the way into customer. And we'll use the, the set, we'll use the setters to place those values into our local customer. Then here's a while loop. First thing we'll do is print out the current customer and we'll read the next customer. And we'll keep doing that until we reach the end of the file. Once we reach the end of the file, the try will fail and we'll come out here with a catch. And so we'll either reach the end of the file, here's we'll catch an end of file exception and then return, meaning success, or if we catch any other type of exception, we'll say unable to open the ATM accounts file and return with a negative one. The code to select an account displays a menu. As long as we get a C, an S, or an X, we're done, and we will return the account type. If we get something else, we'll keep asking again. Here's a method to get the balance from the file. We already know the customer index because we did the search for customer and we saved our index, and the account type is either going to be checking or savings. We'll start off by creating an ATM object named customer. Open up the file, seek to our current customer. I'll read from the file and use the setters to place it into the customer. If the account type from above was C for checking, then we'll get the balance from checking. If it is the savings, then we'll get the savings and place it into our local variable called balance and return the balance. So then this guy right here says get balance. The return data type is a double. For withdrawing, I want to make sure that the amount is an even multiple of $20 and the maximum is $500. We also need to make sure that the customer has sufficient funds for that withdrawal. Again, create an ATM object, name it customer. We'll ask for the amount of withdrawal in increments of $20 up to $500 and get that amount as a double. Now here's a nice little trick. I'm going to take that amount and I'm going to multiply it by 100. So now what really I'm doing is I'm working in pennies, right? So this is an integer. So if the withdrawal amount is less than zero, message that says withdrawal must be greater than zero. If the withdrawal amount is greater than 500, and we'll say it must not exceed 500. And the last thing I need to do is to make sure that it's an increment of $20. I'll take the withdrawal amount times 100, which means that this is the value in pennies. Do a division and use the mod, which is the remainder. So I'm dividing by 2,000, which is $20 in pennies. 
If the remainder is not a zero, then I'll put out a message saying we need to be an increment of $20. If all of these things pass, then I can come down here and actually do the withdrawal. So here's a try block. Open the customer file, seek to the proper record, then I'll read the account number, the PIN, and the checking amount and the savings amount. If the account type is checking, I'll get the amount in checking, subtract the withdrawal amount, and say that is the new balance, and then use set checking to put the new balance back into the object that I created at the top of the program. I'll do the same thing for savings, except this time I'll get the savings amount, subtract the withdrawal amount, and stick that one back into the savings for the customer object that I created above. Seek back to the same record, and then write all these items back into the file and close the file. Pretty cool. Now, to do a deposit, Oh, check that out. All, the only code I have here is a return zero, so that means you're going to need to write the code for the deposit, which is going to be similar up here, but instead of subtracting, you're going to add. Also, we don't have to check to see if it's greater than 500 or an increment of $20. Here are a few methods that are created to read from the keyboard and verify that valid data was entered. Say get a character, it's going to read the next value convert to uppercase and return the first character that it read. Getting an integer, it reads an integer, but since it's inside of a try block, if there's an error, somebody typed in something non-integer, we'll fall out and hit the catch block. Here's a do loop. Try again. It's initially set to false, but if we got something where it didn't match up and I had an error, I'll set try again to true and we'll keep in this loop setting it to a false, reading another integer, and as long as try again equals true, because we still have an error, we'll stay in the loop. As soon as try again is left being false, we will return. Same type of thing for getting a double. The code for the C program and the code for the C++ program are pretty much identical. The only big differences are going to be the way we open a file, the seek, and the way we read the file. So you can actually go back and look at the code for those and see exactly how it's done.